So I guess everyone's been drowning in analysis since last Wednesday. And one of the questions to ask is what more can be said? So one of the topics that we've covered a bit on the channel and I think was worth returning to is the return of the irrational, uh, the return of the religious bubbling into our secular modern world. And you couldn't really get a clearer sign of that than the imagery, the QAnon shaman in the Senate, uh, the nature of QAnon kind of becoming this um, bubbling under for so, for so long and then becoming kind of center stage in the American story and the world story. So I reached out to some of the experts on this topic, the esoteric, the irrational, the archetypal, including the author of Dark Star Rising, Gary Lackman. My first reaction was like, and it was sort of like a reality TV uh, program, um, which one of the themes that I talk about in Dark Star Rising um, is, you know, Trump, when I first heard that he was running, I knew he would win because what made most sense then was that, of course, a reality TV star would become president of the United States because, as they say in the book, so much of reality had gone on to television. And so there's an interchange once those, you know, those, those membranes are perforated, <laughs> things move in both directions and Trump appeared in real life. The psychedelic cultural historian, Eric Davis. Just take the Q shaman in the Senate chambers. You have this symbol of orderly procedure, even though we all know it's riven with rivalry and lies and politics and enmity and massive forces from across the society, it maintains this space of, of decorum. And so to just, just the fact of this, the, the entrance of this character, who's so inflamed with this contemporary, I mean, you could call it irrationality, you could call it new mythology, you could call it memes, you could call it uh, mystic. And the author who's written extensively about conspirituality, Jules Evans. And the tragedy is that I think we've been trying for years to integrate other states of consciousness and to say that they're valid and that just, just rational consciousness is too narrow and not enough. And what's happened in the last 12 months is a kind of flooding of other types of consciousness, of, of mythical thinking, you know, of, of ecstatic type thinking, but, but in a very toxic form. Um, and so it, and, and maybe there's been this kind of crazy, the pendulum swimming back too far, and now we've got to try and find some balance. Not simply reject it and say anything that's not completely rational, analytical, is deluded and irrational. But find some kind of balance between an openness to things like intuition, to things like ecstatic states, trance states and so on, but balancing it with discernment and critical thinking. We've talked before quite a bit about the, the irrational, breaking into the rational. And for me, this whole, that on Wednesday, that particular symbolism of the Q shaman and the, the takeover of Capitol Hill, and that link to QAnon, and th those links to, um, to, to met to much sort of irrational thought, like feels like a, a deeply symbolic moment of that eruption of the irrational into the rational and sort of feels a little bit like a like you can't put that back in the box in a way. Maybe it's a herald of something else that's happening. What did you think when you saw it? It sort of feels like a culmination of much that you've been writing about, much that you've been predicting maybe. Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't in that sense uh, terribly surprising, although I, I would still say it was shocking in a good way, meaning not that it was good that it happened, but that the shock I think is what you're talking about in terms of trying to identify what actually happened here, as opposed to the last, you know, five years of a steady buildup of irrationality, mythology, paranoia, occult a a language, occult actions, perhaps, even if we want to get into meme magic and things like that, um, from from more in, in terms of the the run up to the to the last election. Uh, but this time, it's the, the the shock is is visceral. It's like a, like it's like when there's a real symbol. You know, we use the word symbolic to often mean like, oh, it's merely symbolic. It's just standing in for something else. And then there's that deeper, more romantic in the in the movement, literary movement sense, sense of the symbol as like capital S, the symbol, which is like greater than the concept. So rather than just being merely a stand in for something, there's that deeper sense of the symbol that, that is um 
almost transcendent. And in this sense, what made this shocking was that it was like a symbolic event, not that it was merely a symbol, but rather that it was so powerful because you had this layering. If you just take the Q shaman in the Senate chambers, you have this symbol of orderly procedure, even though we all know it's riven with rivalry and lies and politics and enmity and massive forces from across the society, it maintains this space of, of decorum, you know, uh, more than the part, more than the parliament in the UK, where they get to like grumble and, you know, there's a lot more performance in it. I mean, there's a lot of performance here, but there's, there's something about the American uh, civic religion, because in a lot of ways, that's what one of the ways of looking at uh, America, what makes America different in a lot of ways is that we never had a kind of dominant religion as part of government. You know, yes, Protestantism in some general sense, but uh, we never had anything like Anglicanism or your Catholic France or whatever it is. It's just there's nothing like that. But what we had almost instead is the creation of a much more elaborate civic religion that we're all brought up in. And even those of us who are critics or, or radicals, even some radicals will still produce language around the civic religion. So this is a very sacred place as well as a very rational and procedural place. And so to just, just the fact of this, the, the entrance of this character who's so inflamed with this contemporary, I mean, you could call it a rationality, you could call it new mythology, you could call it memes, you could call it uh, mystic uh, nonsense. I mean, there's a lot of things you could call it and we don't even really need to know that much. Just the visual, just the invocation of the horns and the animal and the tats and the, and the you know, if you want to go into the tats and what those mean. And I don't even know if the guy we can even say that he's a racist. You know, some people will identify some of these tattoos and say, oh, well, that's a symbol for among the, the you know, the, the nationalist white heathens or whatever. And you're like, yeah, but you can't say that because there's other, other heathens who like those symbols who aren't necessarily racist. And in a way, that's partly what makes this guy, you know, I don't say interesting is that, you know, having dug a little bit into his previous uh, appearances on podcasts and, you know, read up on him and whatever, is that he doesn't seem to be someone who is motivated by hate or bitter or, or particularly intense bitterness or resentment. He seems to be someone who's motivated by kind of visionary experiences and kind of wacky ideas in the sort of new age zone. And like so many people, as you and I have discussed, people in that zone got hoovered into QAnon for a variety of reasons. When he appeared, I just um, logged in. I, I, I checked his um, Facebook account, which was all public. He had a YouTube account as well. There were some interviews with him. Uh, and just from that, I mean, the, the amazing thing about these, um, about QAnon conspiracy theorists is they're extremists, they're, they're radicals, but they're not hiding in any sense. On the contrary, they're desperate to be heard, they're desperate to have a platform. So it's very easy to, to find out about them and to gain a, a sense of their mindset. Um, so we know now that uh, his, he's an, a, a not very successful actor called Jake Angeli, uh, emerged today when he was arrested. His real name is Jacob Chansley. Um, and he's also a uh, self-initiated shaman. Uh, he calls himself uh, Yellowstone Wolf and, and, and various other kind of um, alter egos. Um, he, he promotes psychedelic ceremonies for mental health. Um, and, uh, you know, in some ways he's a kind of classic hippie who seems to, like many people in the wellness and spirituality worlds, have been um, radicalized in the last 12 to 18 months through the Q conspiracy, through just absorbing all this stuff online, which seems to have taken complete kind of grip of his personality um, and given him a sense of identity and an audience and a, and a platform. Uh, and then briefly took this, this figure to the center of the kind of the history books for one day at least. The longer we keep this up, the more the word gets out and the more our children will be saved from these globalists. Okay, they are, all their stuff is hidden in plain sight. Check this out. 
at Arrowhead Mall here in, in Arizona. This symbol is their chosen symbol at Arrowhead Mall. Okay? What the fuck, Arrowhead? Why are you using pedophile code in your symbolism? Okay, and it's because, I think, because this symbol says that Arrowhead Mall is a safe haven for certain people with certain tastes, in particular, boy love. And if we begin to look for this type of symbolism, or if we begin to look for things like um, certain code words, like pasta or pizza, and if the pizza sign has like devil horns or something like that, that's something to watch out for. It's like hyper pattern detection. Um, he, on his Facebook page, he had posts of people seeing, of him noticing weird shapes in clouds, like a shape in the clouds that looks like uh, the hands of God, another big cloud that to him looked like a sniper aiming a rifle, which is classic kind of patternicity. Um, and so the positive side of that is seeing some benevolent God behind all events. The flip side of that is seeing demonic powers um, behind events and when he's driving around Arizona in his full face paint and his broken down car um, yeah he's, he's seeing the external world through this um, mythical lens he's almost like dreaming while awake mm. seeing secret uh, demonic codes everywhere he also thought that COVID testing sites uh, supposedly had a picture of a dog on it so therefore obviously this was a temple of Anubis, the Egyptian god of, of the dead. So it's like, it's like um, an over-caffeinated Dan Brown. Everything is code, everything is secret. It's like the occult imagination. Um, and it's ironic in a way because, I, I mean, as I pointed out, like he's got a, a Wotan Nordic tattoo. He's covered in tattoos. And one of them is of a, of a kind of triangle shape. And if you were a real obsessed pedo hunter you go oh a triangle that's uh, that's that's code for um you know a pedophile um and sure enough now various members of QAnon have have turned on him and said actually he's a luciferian or he's an antifa plant mm. so yeah i mean it, it, he basically his personality portrays several classic kind of features of uh, of a tendency towards conspirituality there's the kind of patternicity, there's just constantly seeing kind of secret signs and patterns everywhere. Um, there's a tendency to trance states, to kind of dissociation, um, which is often connected to childhood trauma. And in fact, in one of his interviews, he talks about um, having a very rough childhood and his father making him smoke drugs when he was 11, and that sending him into a dissociated state where he felt he was on an alien planet. So one of my uh, conspiracy theorists are often obsessed with uh, trance states. They think there's this, um, sometimes they think there's a secret elite using like trance programming to control their audience. They think Hollywood is, you know, like Disney's constantly putting secret codes in to mind control us. Um, and I think what it's, what's actually happening is that these are sometimes people who've had traumatic childhoods who are prone to dissociation in adulthood which is basically their childhood haunting them. But they're projecting that onto the external world and turning it into a grand cosmic drama where there's some all-powerful global cabal uh, abusing the world. So you can't even assume that you can't reduce him to a hate person, which is what a lot of the secular left or the liberals press want to do with this whole, this whole crowd, is that they're motivated by... Uh, you know, violence and hate. And you're like, yeah, some of them were motivated by violence and hate and racism and all of that. But if you just look at it on that level, you actually miss this deeper symbolic drama, which has to do with the limits of reason, which has to do with this sense in the piece that I wrote, I, I quoted a line from an H.P. Lovecraft novella, The Case of Charles Dexter Ward, which comes up a lot in occult circles It's well well known, which is do not call up any that you cannot put down. Good advice for a occult practitioner working with the dark forces, but also pretty good advice or uh, you know too late advice for Republicans in this country that they really kind of made a deal with the devil or they they did a sorcerer's apprentice move or however whatever kind of occult metaphor you want. And it's interesting to me that 
again, because the, the mainstream media and a lot of the uh, liberals and the left are generally pretty secular, they actually kind of miss that whole side of it. You, you cannot get a more obvious symbolic um, image of, 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 of that, of the, of the irrational mm. bursting into the center of American power. It's, mm. it's extraordinary. How would you frame that kind of that broader? Well, suddenly the stuff that was on the fringe you know, that people like me and, and the colleagues, they write about this stuff, but it's sort of, you know, still marginalized, even though in popular culture, it's very, I mean, what's all over television, all these shows about magic and these days. So, uh, but there it's tamed, it's tamed there. And that's, I think one of the things is that you can say the last big outburst of irrational uh, in, in, in a popular way, I would say would have been the sixties, the late sixties. And there it was more or less aligned with the leftist kind of notion of radical politics. And, and kind of thing. But again, that was one of the things that struck me, just seeing it on the, on the news, it, that one of the first things I thought of was the 1967 um, march against the Vietnam War, where Abby Hoffman and lots of people, well, they wanted to encircle the Pentagon so they could levitate it. And then Kenneth Anger and um, uh, Ed Sanders from the Fugs were on a, a flatbed sort of truck trying to exercise the pentagram. It was, I mean, if you read Norman Mailer's, I think it's armies of the night that book all about that so it's the same again you could take out the politics but what's actually happening in many ways was this kind of tribal archetypal primordial back to the unconscious or the irrational kind of thing and as you say what 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 caps off the end of the 20th century or the end of the american century it's kind of like in a way it's kind of like the vandals turning up at rome you know that image there with the horns and it's kind of like the barbarians have, are here we're not waiting for the barbarians anymore. They've arrived. And, and it's like, but they didn't know what to do. You know, that was the kind of thing. And Trump, again, I don't know. I mean, he, he wasn't, he didn't suddenly sound the call and the military, you know, took up arms and then, you know, we're saving the country. That would have been in the movie. But th the odd thing was that they kind of emerged. And like you said, it just, it just emerged and it's sort of there and it has a kind of energy of its own for a while, but then, then it dissipated. But the thing might be is that, oh, we know how to do this now you know, oh, we can do this. <laughs> so then once you think you can do it, then it's like, well, let's go do it on purpose now. So no, I'm not predicting anything, but that, you know, that may be, you know, bubbling away somewhere. I guess the, the, the bit to pick up on is, is the QAnon aspect of it. So we've talked a little bit about conspiracy theories before, and it's a difficult one to talk about because it encompasses so much, like stuff that we know, hidden agendas that we know exist. But QAnon for me is a really good example of a totalizing religious mindset of a conspiracy theory. Like it's, it is, there, there's no room for doubt. It's an, it's a all encompassing explanation. And I remember one regret I have is not doing, not, not doing more on it as, as a channel, because when I first saw it, I think a couple of years ago, it was, it, the archetypal power of that worldview is just so, obvious and then also the way that it's completely epistemically closed because anyone that contradicts it is therefore on the other side of the the they're part of the the forces the that are trying to shut it down yeah they're and and it's epistemically closed to any information that does not agree with it which is and i, I i've been it's been so clear and i think your work reflects this as well that we are seeing the return of the religion which, which seeing the return of the religious and QAnon was clearly the most powerful mimetic actor in that space on 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 the right um i've read a few really interesting articles by a games designer who said it's a work of genius because he created it's created with just enough space for you to fill in the gaps so it's like a kind of find your own adventure game and also that the central narratives of it are deliberately disassociative if you really believe, you really think into what it would mean if there are a, a gang of satanic pedophiles kidnapping children, drinking their blood, et cetera, et cetera. Like that is an incredible, like if, you, if you're able to do that and able to visualize that. And I think that's part of the reason it has such hold over women, because I think they, they have a natural ability to kind of imagine what that might be like. And that's an incredibly traumatizing, dissociative place to be. And that's that's a psychological technique. That's a psycho technique for, for then uh, taking people into a state of dissociation and then they can fill in the gaps and build up a new world beyond the other side. Um, 
I mean, what do you make, how, how, how much have you been sort of tracking the Q phenomenon? What do you make of it as a kind of religious? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very interested in those in those aspects. I think it's really uh, fascinating to try to contemplate or or read into research, as they like to say, the possible origins of it. Not because I believe we're ever going to get to a smoking gun, because I think that a that smoking gun is is well disguised, and there are multiple smoking guns. But also that once it got rolling, other factors came in, and that it's it, it's uh, reductive to sort of you know say okay, this is its origins. That's what it is. It's a psyops campaign. It's a it's a you know LARP that got out of control. It's a, a certain kind of clever racist you know. Uh, uh, ideology disguised as a myth or whatever it is. It's all, it's all of those. And that's part of the point. Like if there's a way to reflect one of the curiosities of our moment, it's that the line between psyops, gaming and media discourse are breaking down. So you can look at it as psyops, and then you have a particular kind of like dark, like it's another, in a way it's the kind of uh, QAnon in reverse in the sense that you have to posit these very dark actors who are really manipulative and you don't, you know, mm -hmm. no, no. but it's also just a game. Hey, you know, it's a game, got out of hand. Oh, you know, we were just screwing around, seeing what we could do. And there's obviously a lot of very obvious game elements to what's going on. So gaming was clearly part of what was loosed. And then there's the fact that whatever we think of the, the origins, that something and other factors, other energies, other things took over. For example, you have pointed out this the, the, the role of affect, of trauma and horror, and the sense of real evil. And I think that's one of the real key elements, and one of the things that makes it makes it religious, even if people don't think they're thinking religiously when they're in that mode, is that when you force people, particularly in a modern world where we're largely, you know, you know, there's there's a lot of exceptions to this. There's a lot of conservative Christians in in the United States of America, but a lot of us are. are brought up in a fairly pretty pluralistic situation. We're kind of taught that good and evil, yeah, it's, it may be helpful sometimes, but it usually gets in the way, might even get you in trouble. Better to approach society in a pluralistic way. There's different viewpoints. And then some people, well, there's moral relativism. And you're like, yeah, I guess so. But you know, it's, you know, we're just doing our best job here. And you know, we still know bad stuff when we see it. And all of that, the ambiguity of all that is anxiety producing uh, for, for a lot of people. And uh, it's, it, also it also draws people away from one of the core affective drivers of a more conservative Christian stance or a more conservative religious one, which is like, no, 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 there really is good and there really is evil and evil is an active substance. Now, it's interesting because if you go into Christian theology, there's a long discussion about whether even from a very dualistic perspective, evil actually exists. You know, Augustine is more likely to say, no, it's not that evil exists, it's that it's the absence of God. So it doesn't really exist, it's just somewhere out there because God's not quite fully present everywhere. You know, begs other kinds of questions, but it's actually really an important question because the more that you give substance and agency to evil, the more you set yourself up to be very uh, open to these kinds of narratives. And it's, an, it's, a, it's on the level of emotion and imagination, not on reason. Because you can go, yeah, there's probably elite pedophile circles in the, or on, you know, on planet Earth. In fact, I'd put a lot of money on that. We can see signs, Jimmy Seville, whatever. It's, why wouldn't it? Look at the Catholic Church. I mean, come on. But that there, so even though we recognize that that's evil behavior, it's different to then substantialize that and turn it into this kind of mega monstrous agency that has control behind all of these hidden factors of society. Now I'm giving it more and more and more power 
which then in turn puts me in a certain position where I am both more righteous, where I can justify not uh, uh, rejecting all that dodgy, reasonable, pluralistic kind of stuff. And I'm, I am also kind of a victim because that's the dominant force in reality. And I'm just part of this remnant, the saving remnant. And that saving remnant thing is all over QAnon. You know, they're, the emotionality, the, you know, where we go, when we go, all that sense of connection, the sense of intimacy, of kindness, of friendliness among these people. I mean, if you look at the material, it's not unremittingly dark. In fact, a lot of it is actually quite, you know, go uh, join the club, you know, we're, come on, tune in. And there's actually, there's even a, a whole sort of apocalyptic language of transformation that's embedded in the more new age sides of it, where this is all part of this great revelation. And the whole point is to tune into the light. Don't listen to all that stuff that's making things confused. Tune into the light. That's what we're being asked to do. So there is some genuine new age, uh, you know, elements that are deep inside it, alongside these kind of Christian Manichaean elements. And so part of what we're seeing is kind of like a new religion that we don't know how to recognize as such, because in some formal ways, it doesn't resemble religion as we've seen it before. But to my mind, it makes the most sense. It's the best large basket, even though it doesn't include everything, for example, the way it's like a game or the way it's like psyops, all, both of which are also important to see. But I think to really sort of recognize and even not sympathize, but sort of acknowledge the people who have been drawn into this PSYOPs LARP, uh, it's best to see it as a religion because then you go, all right, they're deluded, but the kernel of their delusion is not necessarily hate and bitter resentment. It has aspects of that, but part of their delusion is a genuine desire to right wrongs, to resist the, the evil that is in the world, that is systematically, absolutely structured, woven into the deal from day one, never going to get rid of it. It's just going to change and maybe even grow. And that's a horrible feeling. And to be able to like congeal it and then fight against it, it's like, I get it. Like, I appreciate it. I don't, I don't think you're just an idiot, even though I have trouble with all the rap, you know, the, how you got there. And so for me, thinking about it in terms of religion is not just helpful socio sociologically, but it also acknowledges that whether you want to think about it in metaphoric terms or not, spiritual forces are at play. I mean, it's not, and I, by that, I really want to insist I don't mean a particular story about what a spiritual force is, but let's just say something a transpersonal or outside of individual human um, behaviors or patterns or archetypal, whatever, in a way it doesn't matter. But what's important is to acknowledge that it's not just a phenomenon of people who don't know how to think very well, who are being manipulated by certain forces online or, or, or you know, feedback loops or YouTube algorithms, whatever. It's like, yes, but there are, there's something bigger here about human beings, about evil, about imagination and about some kind of yearning or need for something beyond the dwindling, cracked, tattered, rational consensus of neoliberal uh, organization and governance, which is not doing so hot. So as those cracks open up, you know, that's what I end that piece with, with, with that Bowie line about, you know, all the nightmares came today. Looks as though they're here to stay. It's like we're, you know, there, there's some real deep stuff that is now, uh, you know, uh, slouching around to be born. I think that people who've been uh, traumatized are more prone to black and white thinking, clear divisions between the good guys and the bad guys, the white hats and the black hats, uh, that kind of thing. I think, you know, the, the tragedy of, of the last 12 months for me from a spiritual perspective and I think it's it's been it's been so it's such a kind of wake-up call and so disenchanting the last 12 months and I feel like it's made me I've never called myself an agnostic before and now I feel like an agnostic I've seen other people as well 
just feeling kind of sickened by spiritual culture, which we consider our culture. And the tragedy is that I think we've been trying for years to integrate other states of consciousness and to say that they're valid and that just, just rational consciousness is too narrow and not enough. And what's happened in the last 12 months is a kind of flooding of other types of consciousness, of, of mythical thinking, you know, of, of ecstatic type thinking, but, but in a very toxic form. Um, and so, it, and, and maybe there's been this kind of crazy, the pendulum swimming back too far, and now we've got to try and find some balance. Not simply reject it and say anything that's not completely rational, analytical, is deluded and irrational but find some kind of balance between an openness to things like intuition, to things like ecstatic states, trance states and so on, but balancing it with discernment and critical thinking. Have you been following the, the QAnon narrative close? No, I mean, it's, it's peripherally um, because uh, that kind of, that's, that's, a, that's such a can of worms. That, that's such a, you know, just a cascade of trap doors, I, I, I always find. So I, I, I judiciously, and very prudently stay away unless I have to. So if somebody asks me to write something about it, I'll go check. I mean, it's there, it's kind of in the background. I didn't realize how big it was getting um, mm. until uh, more recently, I, I saw a lot of tweets about it and people pointing out that again, as happened say in the thirties where a lot of these what we call spiritual or occult or back to nature, whatever you want to say ideas, they somehow got mixed up in this melange with far right ideas or you know because i guess that's the thing about QAnon. you have a lot of people are on the conspiracy side of it with you know the vaccine or you know whatever it is gm crops or whatever the current you know fear is and so they're there for that and <laughs> but you know attached to this seamlessly is the other other side of it and so you have this strange phenomenon and that's always a sign of the times that things are breaking down where you get the, the polarities are you know, they're, they're not far apart anymore. They're like this, even though there's all this dissension, but they're, there's, that's why they're, they're, it's like, it's like they're all really close to each other and they can't get away and they're snarling and fighting and there's not enough room. Sorry, my, my metaphoric mind kept going there for a second. But. And I mean, the interesting, one of the interesting things about that, to take QAnon as, exa as an example, is the archetypal force of that kind of I don't, I'd be interested in why you feel like you don't want to go too far near it. You talked about trapdoors, but for me, like it has such an archetypal pull. Like mm. we, we hear lots of stories of people who get into it and then lose contact with their families. Oh yeah. Kind of lots of, lots of people saying that they're, yeah, they, they've completely lost members of their family who go down these rabbit holes. And part of that surely is the, the archetypal force of these, of these narratives that you're you're suddenly in in a theological landscape where you're basically kind of you're dealing with Satan, like Bill Gates as Satan or Hillary Clinton, uh, uh, uh. all these sort of things, and it's yeah, well, it's it's it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's an ample canvas on which to project a lot of stuff, um, and that was one of the first things I noticed about when Corona Mania first hit, say back last year. I mean, the first thing people were doing were joking about the end of the world uh in the supermarkets and all that and it was kind of like ooh, okay. <laughs> i couldn't wait for something like that to come so i could you know and it's there so it bubbles up so um no i i think the thing is what's well, what one of the things i say in the the the, the stuff the stuff i posted it was that we live in a world now where everything is plausible but nothing is definite so um i think one of the uh, um the things is with the conspiracy theories if it has just enough Plausibility, you know, you, things are difficult or uncertain, really don't know what, what is what anymore, blah, blah, blah. And if something has just enough plausibility to get you, you know, the thin, ed, thin edge of the wedge, as it were, and then you pick it up and then that's the first trap door. And then you keep following, following. Um, but I also say in this thing I posted that uh, in some ways I see conspiracy theories as Jung saw neuroses where they were a good sign. They weren't good in themselves. They were a good sign in the sense that, uh, you know, at, at least the person's fighting back in some way against something. It's, it's an ineffectual way. It doesn't work. It, it's causing problems. That's why they're here. But they're, rather do, they're doing that instead of just accepting whatever it is and so on and so on. So I would say a lot of conspiracy theory is about, you know, we've been told the un life is meaningless, universe is meaningless. There's nothing behind anything at all, we're here because 15 billion years ago, 
less than nothing blew up for no reason. And that's why eventually you and I are having this conversation. So I don't know, that, that, that doesn't, you know, hack it for a lot of people. So something else can fill that vacuum. And for some people, it's the closest thing, whatever it's the, you know, oh, they're in charge. You know, it was the, you know, the protocols of the elders of Zion, uh, um, whatever, you know, it was the Jews and the Marxists and whoever, you know, now it's, you know, these, <laughs> these who is can it? You, can it's, you unpack that, Gary? I, I, that was a really interesting point what? that you made about um, conspiracy being equivalent to new, look, what Jung called neurosis and that it's a sign mm. that... It, I, I, what I understand you meaning is that it's at least you're not apathetic. You are actually trying yeah, to yeah. understand it's the a, world. Can you well, it's a possible right. sign of, it's, yeah. Uh, in this context, I would say it's, um, I mean, Jung, it's about, okay, you're in some kind of situation that you shouldn't be in, but for some reason or other, you can't get out of it. And, but you, you develop some kind of reaction to it that is, 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 is neurotic reaction. It's ineffectual, but it's a, it's a response. Um, and, uh, to ward off the reality that you really should be dealing with in a way, let's say it's a buffer. But I would say in the context of our planetary consciousness now, or at least in the, the, the Western world or uh, America, because it's, it's, it's happening here, here as well. I mean, the Brits are a bit more, you know, skeptical of these kinds of things. They, and they don't have the hot gospel that they have in America, which is they just go for it. But um, we, I said, we've been told for the longest time that life is meaningless. The universe is meaningless, you know, and certainly, I'm going to say, you know, the whole left movement arises out of a materialist philosophy. Karl Marx, religion is opium of the people. You know, there is no meaning. There's no metaphysical meaning behind everything. It's just, you know, the means of production and economics and so on and so on and so on. And if that's the case, we can rationally plan, you know, life. That, that's broken down. <laughs> That's broken down among other, other kind of scientific ways to explain things. And like I said, what we're told is like, well, actually, nothing means anything. It's up to you in a free society to make whatever meaning you want. You know, mm -hmm. some people can do that. You know, the people I write about, uh, uh, and uh, uh, because of my interest in the work of Colin Wilson, he calls them the outsiders. And these are people that are driven by an intense appetite for meaning. And many of them manage to generate something. But not everybody can, but they still have the appetite for it. And... But I feel like the progressive world, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't recognize that because that's religion, that's mysticism, that's magic. It's not science. It's not rationality. And the other side just goes for it. You know, they, they use the myth because they know it's there. It, they, they, they can go underneath the critical mind and activate those, those energies. And it's not the energies aren't what's bad. It's what's being used to activate them. And if you don't have a discriminating mind, or if Jung's saying, if you're not individuated, if you don't sort of have your inner world um, in some kind of order and balance, you could get carried away because they're, they're tremendously powerful forces and it feels good when they carry you away. That's why we love, you know, people love going to football games. They, you know, ah, when you're a team, it's like you can conquer the world. You feel incredibly powerful and you are temporarily. Those people who went into the capital they must have felt like they were on top of the world. Olympus has fallen. To whom? <laughs> to us, you know? So they must have fell on top of the world and they're dazed afterwards. So it's, it feels good, but the, the, the bad guys, let's say, know how to harness it. They know how to use it because they accept that it's there. They're, they're hypocritical. Some maybe not be, some may be honest, but they're hypocritical. They know it's there, you know, they, and they know they can tap it. Um, but the, supposed good guys, I don't know, the progressives or the left or whatever, they want to deny it and they want to educate us out of it. But that's never going to happen. That's why it explodes because we haven't integrated it. You know, it explodes in these ways because it doesn't go away, just like in your own life. If you don't integrate it in your own life, it, it turns up in ways that are, um, you know, um, detrimental and painful. Someone that I admire his thinking, Jordan Hall, put out a piece about mm. QAnon being a kind of nascent collective intelligence, which I thought mm. was a really interesting frame. Mm. Like, it looks kind of completely crazy, but it's a whole load of people trying to make sense together, mm. and there's sort of, can we sift and find the gold within the sort of, the chaff, effectively? You could say it succeeded in terms of grouping a lot of people together, in persuading stroke infecting a lot of people all around the world, giving them a strong sense of meaning, really kind of pumping them up and galvanizing them, uh, getting them obsessed. So that's true. As a viral campaign, massive hit, deserves to win all the awards. 
um, as a collective intelligence organism, what does, it, what does an intelligent organism need to do? It needs to make predictions about the future, uh, read its environment in ways that are accurate, learn to kind of test when its predictions are inaccurate and adapt. That's what collective intelligence is. And on that, I mean, it fails in its own terms. Like, has it helped to stop kind of paedophilia? No, it's got in the way. It's actually harmed, actually, prop, you know, agencies that protect um, children from trafficking. By flooding them with false positives. Yeah, and, 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 and just, just, yeah, no, like, you know, it's just driven unstable people to kind of drive around accusing other people of being pedos based on, like, codes, on the idea that paedophiles put codes in their windows mm. to identify their sexual preferences. I mean, that's the kind of, that's it, that, you know, that's, that's really not collective intelligence. Uh, it's failed in terms of the, its whole prediction about the future was there was going to be this storm and all these, there were all these um, high level uh, satanic pedos would be arrested and taken to Guantanamo Bay. Trump definitely knew exactly what was going on. That prediction has massively failed. That, this is a kind of, uh, you know, a rapture type apocalyptic prediction. So in that sense, in terms of as, as a collective intelligence organism, it's, it doesn't, it's, it's not going to survive for, I predict, um, for um, many years. Like, I don't think, you know, I don't think it's, I think it's had a good, well, I think, I think it's had a good five years. Well, I do think you're, I do think you, it's proven, it's, it's kind of proof of concept. Mm. It's proven that people right now desperately need um, certainty, hope, myth, black and white thinking, medieval villains, you know, demons, witches, this kind of thing, uh, and, and, you know, saviors bestowed with uh, exalted power. Yeah, I guess that was my, my next question, which was, is this, the, is this the culmination of something? You can make an argument that this is the, the, the finale of the Trump show, like it's sort of the, the grand finale um, last episode, or it could be the herald of something, something new, something more. And I mean, on a on a sort of functional level, you you could see that Trump is potentially going to continue. Trumpism is certainly going to continue. That is going to continue to be a force in American politics. But on a wider level, is it also a kind of herald of a symbolic moment, a significant moment where the 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 um, the jack is out of the box and will not be put back in. Do you think we, we just go more weird from here or do we, or is this no. a weird high point? I mean, my sense of history, and this is just guess, I, I don't have any reason to believe one version or another. My sense of history is that there is a kind of pendulum swing and that even though overall things are probably unraveling on, on many, many, many different levels, that I won't, I won't be surprised if there's kind of a, a pushback in the other direction that tends to isolate uh, and peel off, you know, uh, members from the sides of what QAnon or or, or uh, Trump Landia um, to a degree, and that maybe on the surface, on the kind of like mainstream level or the uh, go uh, governance level. There, there's sort of a reassertion of, of, of more business as usual um, that creates these little pockets and maybe they're not so little and maybe they get big again and maybe they start to flare up and we see little outbreaks here and there of actual actions, maybe violence um, and maybe an intensification of these, these, uh, these memes online. I, I kind of feel like the, the, there's going to be a little bit of the... Uh, you know, the wind out of the sails of some of the online buildup as, as it just becomes more confusing and complex, that it's just, it's harder to, to locate. But my, my deeper fear is that to the degree that this was set in motion, managed, programmed, set up, this is the PSYOPs meets LARP approach, that to the degree that that was fully conscious and done from maybe not even from the get-go in this case with specific political forces, but those political forces came along and advantageously took it, you know, took over or inserted themselves into something that now is really outside of anybody's hand. 
uh, which I want to get back to in a second, that because of that, now we've just had a test run. Well, that went pretty far. Okay, now the next time we do that, we're going to be, we're going to dial our game in better. So to the, for those um, bad actors who are smart gamers, we've, this is like a, a, a run through of something that could be done in a, in a different way. But I want to go back to that point about uh, control versus out of control. And I think this comes down to a real fundamental perspective. It may be temperamental. It may be that some of us tend towards seeing things in terms of control and others seeing things in terms of out of control. It, but it has a great deal of difference to how we, it makes a great deal of difference to how we approach thinking about our contemporary moment and thinking about the future. One of the attractions of conspiracy theory is that it's about control, that, that I gain control by knowing, i.e. having a strong belief about who is actually in control and their control is manifested in the fact that all of these different events and seemingly random occurrences are part of a master plan. So I project control as a way to regain control. And I think that the problems with conspiracy theory in a lot of ways it, it shows us some of the dangers of thinking that way beyond a certain point. You know, on the other hand, you can go like, you know, we're at the, we're at this like culminating transformative moment of a process, a historical process that let's say at the very least is 6,000 years old, maybe 10,000 years old. Maybe you want to just take it back to, you know, origins of humanity, you know, all the way back a couple million years old. And we're at this crazy front end of this wave and it's just so complicated and people are nudging, you know, businessmen, Bill Gates, politicians, each of us individually, we're just, we're making little moves here and there, but it's very hard to predict what's happening. It's very hard to engineer things beyond a certain point. And obviously the truth is somewhere between these two models, but they, they really offer us different kinds of not just ideas or ways to proceed, but a different kinds of almost like religious attitudes towards the world. I mean, if I'm in a world where there's less control, I kind of, I got to just be open to what's, I don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm trying to just communicate with other people and sort of be like, hi, hey, how are you holding on there? And like, what do you think we can do here? Well, we could try this, but you know, we're, we're all kind of guessing in the dark here, but yeah, there's better guesses. There's worse guesses. So it's, it actually lends itself to, to more reasonable way of approaching the world. It's not like throwing up your hands because it's a big mystery. It's just being very honest and humble about the degree of control we have at this point because there's so many feedback loops that are just screaming into the future that we're barely holding on. It doesn't mean we can't try to move away from a fossil fuel catastrophe that's already on the horizon, already happening, and try to get into you know renewable renewable energy sources and, and, you know, build the infrastructure for that. That's great. I'm not talking about not doing that kind of thing, but I think that we are more likely to do that the less we believe in that degree of control. And that part of what we see with people who are drawn into these scenarios is that it's just incredibly attractive to mm -hmm. believe that that control is still being exerted because the chaos uh, approach, the not so controlled emergent property you know, the, the, you know, the, the horses are out of the gate approach. It's just existentially terrifying on some level, even though it off, it also offers in some sense, more room to maneuver. Mm. Yeah. And I guess in, from that frame, the, you've got two sort of safe harbors that people are kind of choosing. One of which is sort of the QAnon and similar narratives where you don't have to doubt, you just trust the plan. It's kind of whatever happens, there's an explanation for it. And on the other side, there's the kind of the mainstream narrative that's still trying to hold, kind of trying to hold the center in a way that seems impossible. And then there's the kind of nav dynamic navigation in the middle where you accept that there is, you have to accept that no one's in control. And that's a very tough thing to, to do. Yeah, especially if, you know, I mean, in that sense, I'm, you know, there, there, a lot of my politics are, are somewhat centrist at this point, not because I disbelieve in the ideals of 
more radical positions in some ways, not at all. I mean, on the, you know, you know, kind of conventionally on the left, but it's more that the, where we're at right now is so fragile that I think it's important to keep the, the sticky tatters of the matrix as coherent as possible because there's so many things that are pulling it apart. And we have already seen what actually happens when you step off of that admittedly very problematic game board. Mm -hmm. And so maybe this just reflects the kind of cons conservatism that people have as they, as they get older. But the idea that somehow like the accelerationist idea that we're just going to like, let's just take advantage of this and maximize the chaos and pull down these structures and reveal that all the, you know, you know, all the emperors have no clothes. I don't think that there, there's good bet, a good bet on that being a cleansing restart. Um, and so, you know, in that sense, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, as people try to reconstruct a more uh, or return to an idea of, of America as a kind of rational procedural place with, with legalistic norms as a way to manage a pluralistic society. I'm like, all right, you know, let, you know, I'm not going to stand in your way. I, you know, I might have my doubts, but uh, you know, uh, I think that that in a way just makes the whole thing more interesting to try to recognize, you know, how much intelligence and craft and, uh, 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 know-how is embedded in actual real institutions, even if those institutions are politically fraud and there's tension and under, you know, uh, under, uh, they, they undermine themselves in certain ways. Uh, it's also, I think, a really important place to underscore their, their importance and the importance of institutional know-how as a way of managing what has always been a very complicated uh, reality. It is by no means going to be the last like ecstatic cult of, of the of the next 10, 20 years. And it, and, it, and it wasn't the only one either. I mean, I, I get in trouble when I suggest um, that movements on the left over the last few years have sometimes showed aspects of uh, religious enthusiasm, mm. of, of cultishness. Um, uh, someone as as uh, mediocre as Jeremy Corbyn can be seen as a kind of savior figure. Um, so um, outsiders uh, have really got a chance of getting power at the moment. All you've got to do is, is you know, there's, there's one p political leader who just played a, a president in a TV show, and that was enough to get him elected as, 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 as the leader of his country. So we are going to see, you know, different kinds of um, cults. And, and it'll be interesting to see how this uh, mixes together with the liberalization of uh, psychedelics. Mm. Uh, the Q shaman was, was, was very into psychedelics and that seems to have tapped into his kind of messianic thinking. Mm. So um, that could potentially get messy. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sensemaking 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Mushow hamilton John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sensemaking, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same.